when did you first perform? Well, I was in the school choir. Yeah, and we got good enough that school holidays, the choir performed. They became they were very well attended. And at one point, the music teacher got us all recording sessions for our school choir. And I wish I still had that record. So jumping off from performing, what is your earliest song that you still consider worth performing and hearing? Probably The Thousandth Man, my first Kipling, which Kipple. When I was in school, we, in English class, we got books of poetry. And I began imagining tunes for them because I always had music in my head. I found that one poet whom I really liked, because his, song, his poetry was so singable, was Rudyard Kipling. And I forget how I came across The Thousandth Man, but I especially liked that one. And later, when I got into watching Star Trek, yeah, that's, <laughs> okay, that fits Spock perfectly. I did other Kipples, but that's the one that's still worth performing, I think. Someone here had asked how and when did Leslie get involved with music, both in generally and specifically in Philks? Well, as I say, my mother was a musician and later she became a music teacher. First giving private lessons, then she got a, te a teaching license and became a music teacher in the, in the Essex County school system. And, of course, she taught me to sing and taught, gave me voice lessons. One reason that she hated going to Arizona in the winter is because I would listen to local radio and the local folks singing and pick up country and western songs. That awful cowboy music, which I thought was low class. My mother worshipped class, the way their people worshipped their gods. Even after I came back to New Jersey, I found, once I learned how to manipulate the dial, the dial on that radio, I found there were other stations that would play that awful cowboy music. <laughs> and <laughs> finally, my dad, uh, for my birthday, got me an album. And in those days... Records were all 78s, they were big. And an al a record album was a big, thick book with with records that had two sides, one, one song up each on each, side, on each side. And they were Western songs. And chief among them, the one I liked best was Ghost Riders <laughs> in the Sky, Tex Ritter. So I guess you could see that Tex Ritter was the first musician I really appreciated, <laughs> never mind Brahms, Brahms Lullaby. So how did that segue for you starting to play? Mom tried to teach me piano, but it was not my instrument. My fingers were too small to make the chords, and it was painful. Also, I didn't like the sound as much as I liked the sound of guitar. It wasn't until I got to junior high school where some, some other kid had a guitar, and I got to play it, and I realized, this is for me. But I liked folk music before then. For one thing, it was a segu, an easy slide from that to that from that awful cowboy music <laughs> also mom did have this one book it was the the big called the big book of american folk songs another old friend who studied the same book come, come in you mean the big book of commie folk songs because <laughs> one of the editors was pete seeger <laughs> and, and because that was a formal book mom uh, sang me out of it let me sing out of it taught me how to sing the songs out of it i learned a lot of the spirituals <laughs> I am a poor wayfaring stranger, and so on. And various a clutch of patriotic songs. And one called The Song of the Great Wall, which is supposedly from China. Great wall stretching mile on mile Out beyond thee lies our home da 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 I'm trying to think of other other songs that were in that book, but that oh that's folk music. That's what I want. Fine. And if Mom thinks it's that old folk cowboy music when somebody else when I'm never gonna singing it, well that's okay. I, I'll keep my own counsel on that. I think I think it sounds like your mother didn't understand the dividing line between Western music and actual mm -hmm. folk music. Yeah, well, there isn't that much of a dividing line between Western and folk. There's more of a dividing line between West Western and country actually. See, country is most derived mostly from Appalachian, and yeah, Appalachian and English, uh, but Western is more uh, more derived from Irish and Scottish, and a bit of German too, because there were an awful lot of German cowboys. So, you got into Western and mm -hmm. folk music in general. When did you decide you were going to actually start performing this in public? Well, in my teens, junior high school. 
So I say that's where I ran into folks, uh, other kids who had guitars, six string guitars, and I played. And I, this is my instrument. By then it was pretty obvious I was not going to be a pianist. And much as Mama resisted, I kept hammering on the parents until I finally got a guitar and began to learn it. And a simple beginning prime book. These are the chords, these are the notes, this is how you tune, yada yada. Yes, people, even Leslie was a level zero once. <laughs> Remember, thou too wert a Neo once. <laughs> Let's see, I started, well, first off from that, the big book of American folk songs that we had in the house. I started playing those. Mom was so disappointed because she'd wanted me to learn to play them on the piano, but that wasn't my instrument. She'd get this prune-faced look whenever I played them on the guitar. I didn't care. I'd learned the hard way at an early age. Do not sympathize too much with a manipulative parent. I held on to my own looks, my own likes, my own dislikes, my own uh, conclusions, and my, guitar, and my own instrument, the guitar. It wasn't until I was in high school when I was considered old enough to be allowed to take the bus into Newark and then from Newark uh, Terminal to New York. The, the New York bus terminal was close enough to the Folk Music Center at the edge of Greenwich Village that nobody thought it was dangerous for a teenage girl to be wandering there. Those are very different days. Nowadays, you can, you can only do it in couples, all of you well-armed. I started going around to coffee houses and playing and singing and actually made some money out of the tip jar. Oh, wow, 20 bucks. Oh, yeah. And there's a bookstore in South Orange that had a music section, and I started buying folk music. The folk music boom was just starting then, so I started buying folk music records, at which Mama disapproved. And the folk music books from, what was it? Oh, the same company that published Sing Out magazine. Very influential magazine at the time. It came out every month. It had new songs in it, old songs, revivals of old songs, interviews, instructions on how to play this, how to play that. Very useful magazine. And, of course, the, that led me to the uh, books they published, song books, which is where I came across Woody Guthrie folk, folk songs. And that's how I managed to remember the funny incident when I was a little little kid, maybe three or four, and even then my my joints were very loose. My ankles were weak, and mom wanted to teach my ballet, but I couldn't. I, I hated it because it hurt my ankles. So she finally gave up and put me into a modern dance troupe. It was run by a woman named Marjorie Mazio, and I didn't find out until years later that Marjorie Mazio was the last wife of Woody Guthrie. I just knew that, okay, I was the smallest kid in the class, so I got picked on, and part of the course she would often bring in this little little silver-eyed man, curly hair, silver eyes, who had a guitar. And he would play songs, and the, including kids' songs that were just so enchanting you couldn't help but listen to them. And when he got to playing his children's songs, the other kids couldn't help but dance. They left me alone and went to dance. So I was always very grateful to that little silver-eyed man. I remember this day, take me for a ride in the car, car, take me for a ride in the car, car. Take, take me for a ride, take me for a ride, take me for a ride in the car, car. I remember that song, because that was the one that would get the kids off me. So I became eternally grateful to that little silver-eyed man and his guitar. Only years later, when I was in high school, I learned about Woody Guthrie. I found collections of his songs and bought his songbooks. There was a collection that included his children's songs, and hey, I recognized that. And then I turned to the back of the book and it says, For further information, contact Marjorie Mazia. Uh-huh. So that's who that little silver-eyed man was. And, okay, Woody Guthrie, I read his uh, autobiography, which is a, you know, Bound for Glory, which is a fascinating book. And uh, then I learned that he was, he was sick in a hospital in New York. I was 16 when I figured out how to get there, and I, I, I took my guitar and my songbook baggage, and I went and I used the buses, go all the way into New York, all the way to Kings County Hospital, and I found Woody Guthrie, I went and asked, where is Woody Guthrie? Oh, yeah, other folk singers come up here. You must be a folk singer. I see you get a guitar. Other folk singers come up here and visit him. Yep. He's on fifth floor, ward six, something like that. And up I went, and one of the attendants saw me with the guitar and said, ah, you're here for Woody Guthrie, right? Yep. And so he led me out onto the sun porch where there was a scrawny little man with silver, curly silver hair stretched out on a, on a divan. And he says, hey, Woody, wake up. Here's another of your fans come to talk, come to sing for you. And he blinked, I sat up, looked at me, and yep, silver eyes. That was him. By then, the disease, he had Huntington's choreo. It was very seriously pronounced. He couldn't talk. Man who made his life's work singing couldn't talk and couldn't control his hands, wanted to play guitar. 
that's one of the things that got me seriously questioning religion. I showed him hi, and I told him what my history was. And I was one of those little kids you used to play for in Marjorie Major's dance class. And I just wanted to come and thank you. And he grinned, sort of. And he couldn't talk. He could just sort of nod for no, grunt for yes, and point roughly to whatever he wanted. And trying to figure out what he wanted was a real exercise in, in communications. I believe that's where I got my psychic talent stretched. Figuring out what that point meant. Mm -hmm. Is that what you mean, Woody? And I'd, and I'd follow up. I played in my version of Pastures of Plenty, and he liked it. I played it in minor key, where he, he played it in major. Then I started singing the My songs, and he liked those too. I wrote a song for him, which made him smile. I went back there every weekend I could get away, but within a year and a half I was off to college. I could only get back during the summer, and he got worse and worse, and nothing helped. And finally, I read in the, in the paper that he died. And, damn it. Yeah, that's sad. Hmm. But, what's, what's, but what's beautiful about it is that back then, so many people were able to come to him mm -hmm. and reach out. So, you know, he knew he wasn't alone, and he definitely felt loved. He wanted the kids that he helped coming yeah. to him and saying, look at what I can do because of you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and he did a lot for me, including st stretching my psychic talent. Communicating with him, I could not have gotten one-tenth as much if I hadn't had some kind of some kind of psychic assist. Because, like I say, he could grunt for yes, nod for no, and point, roughly. And that's it. else was communication. So even nowadays, among the pagans, I call myself... I remember the Bardic Order American branch, and my mentor was Woody Guthrie. I told that to Joe Bethencourt once, and he said, Damn, do you know how many folk singers would give their left nut for a past history like that? That is a pretty impressive history. Ah, I didn't know and, it at the time. You and, you, and what makes it so amazing is that you have it because you were doing the right thing, not because you were trying to get notoriety. No, and notoriety, that's what makes hell. It so special. What did I have no. to be notorious about, really? I was 16. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Living at home in a boring suburb.